Shalom and welcome. It's the 12th of February 2024, day 129 of the October 7th war. I'm an Israeli government spokesman Elon Levy, and this is the first episode of the State of a Nation podcast. Here, three times a week, you'll find top stories, the facts about the current conflict, and an in-depth conversation that will bring you behind the scenes of the story capturing the attention and imagination of the world. Together, we'll unpack the state of our nation. So where are we? Last week, more than four months since the October 7 massacre, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reiterated his promise that total victory over Hamas will not take years, it will take months. And in an interview to Jonathan Carl on ABC yesterday, he repeated that victory is within reach. Because since Hamas launched this war, the IDF has dismantled most of the Hamas terrorist army. Hamas forces are collapsing. 18 out of 24 battalions are shattered, and over half of their terrorists are dead, wounded, or captured. Israel is destroying Hamas's massive underground tunnel network, its missiles factories, and its weapons silos. And in a daring operation last night, Israeli special forces successfully rescued two hostages, Fernando Marman and Luis Ha, from the heart of the Palestinian city of Rafah. The IDF demonstrated its ability to operate in the heart of Hamas's last stronghold, and that's two more hostages home, 134 still to bring back. As the Hamas terrorist army nears collapse, the real question is now, what will happen the day after Hamas? Because for peace, it's not enough to just destroy Hamas and demilitarize Gaza. Palestinian society will also have to be de-radicalized so the poisonous ideology that produced Hamas can give way to hopes for peace. And to do that, we've got to take a long, hard look at UNRWA, the UN agency responsible for educating over 70% of Gazans. Will the world still reeling from the recent revelation that at least 13 UNRWA staff members participated in the October 7 massacre? Just two days ago, Israel exposed a Hamas intelligence base a sova farm directly underneath the main headquarters of UNRWA in Gaza City, literally under their noses. But for those who've been paying attention, this came as no surprise, because UNRWA educates 70% of Gazan children, and these UN schools have, tragically, become breeding grounds for extremism and incitement, funded by foreign states under the guise of humanitarian work. So the day after Hamas, is there hope for education in Gaza to advance the cause of peace instead of fueling hatred and resentment and perpetuating this conflict? To answer these questions, I talked with Marcus Sheff. Marcus is the CEO of Impact SE, a non-profit that has been blowing the whistle on how UN schools have been aggravating the Arab-Israeli conflict by promoting values of martyrdom and jihad. Marcus has just come back from testifying in front of the United States House Foreign Affairs Committee about UNRWA's role in creating the extremism that made the October 7th massacre possible in the first place. So join us as we sit down to explore the extent of extremist indoctrination in Gaza's education system to learn about its connections to the Palestinian Authority. While the solution that Marcus lays out is astonishingly simple, the real challenge remains getting the world to listen. Let's get to it. Breaking news out of Israel this morning. Shocking hostage taking. Hundreds of Israelis are dead. I want to bring in Israeli government spokesman. What happens when the four-day course? How do you resolve this? Where does this go from? Marcus Sheff, welcome to the State of a Nation podcast. Absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Before we take a deep dive, I want to ask you what it was like testifying in front of the US House on the Hill, because I'm giving TV interviews all day, mm. but I think appearing on a panel in front of members of Congress, mm -hmm. even I would get tongue-tied. Well, big room and um, everything that you would expect with um, the members sitting right at the top, um, lots of cameras. But I think First Just time testifying before Congress. First time testifying before Congress. Not something you do Congress. every day. Absolutely. Um, but I think the importance of the occasion um, absolutely came through. They were extraordinarily interested 
in what we had to say about UNRWA um, on both sides of the House, the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, I feel this was a moment where we had been talking about UNRWA for, for so long with these individual members. Talking but specifically about talking, education, speaking with these members of Congress behind the scenes. But indeed. now that you're sitting in front of them and you see their faces, how are they reacting? Did you feel mm. that the testimony that you were providing, laying out evidence about mm. incitement in UNRWA's curriculum was shifting their opinions? I mean, could you, could you see the cogs moving? I, 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 without a shadow of a doubt. And, and I think, you know, this was the most important thing. Um, clearly, both sides wanted to hear what we had to say. Clearly, both sides understood that there was a problem, but there was a shift um, on the Democratic side, I think it's fair to say, um, particularly with one member who, you know, at the beginning was, um, from his opening comments, less inclined to understand that UNRWA can no longer teach. And at you were the getting end, some pushback from, from which member of Congress? I think, um, I think the uh, ranking Democratic member uh, was uh, pushing back at the beginning. Um, and which is their job, and what which is their job, do. and they need to hear the information. They need to hear the testimony. That's the the whole point at the end of the day. But at the end, I believe that he entirely got it. He he got this one central idea, which is that UNRWA has failed in its duty of care. Right. UNRWA can no in its longer duty of care with education. To, its duty with of education. care with aid as well. I feel with I, I think across the board, and um, specifically for us with education. Um, you know the teaching program is not fit for purpose. It is something that we had warned about, that we had talked about for so long. Um, there was clearly an absolute recognition from this member and from the other Democrats as well, um, some moderate, some liberal, that this is the case and that this can no longer continue. And I think this particular thing um, was the most significant thing of um, of the whole testimony. But the penny really dropped. The penny absolutely Or, or dropped. the cent drops. What do they say in America? Yes, indeed. Well, we'll, we'll go with the cent drops. Absolutely. Marcus, I, I want, in this conversation we're having, I want you to brief me about what has been going on in UNRWA's education system, how mm. we got where we are now. I want sure. to look a little bit ahead about what we do the day after Hamas, because sure. we've been speaking a lot about de-radicalization and the need sure. to educate towards peace. But I want to take you back first to October 7th. Yeah. I want you to tell me, where were you when the massacre was unfolding? Mm. And while everyone was glued to their TV screens in horror and mm. shock, were you also shocked mm. by what you were seeing having spent your professional career mm. focusing on what was being taught mm. inside Gaza? You know, we had been warning for years that if you teach young people that jihad and martyrdom are the most important meanings in life, if you teach them about violence, if you teach them to be violent, to, to sacrifice themselves. And this is what UNRWA schools and are doing. And this is what UNRWA schools are doing. Do not be surprised when on that particular morning we see murder, beheadings, rape, abduction of babies and the elderly. Wait, you know, just, just to be clear, like, part yes. of that thought, are you saying that the October 7 massacre itself was a product of the UNRWA education system? Because that's a very, I, I mean, that's a very serious claim. I, I, I am saying that if day after day, week after week, month after month, all the way from first grade to the highest grades, you teach young people to act violently, you teach young people that Jews and Israelis are demons. I mean, absolutely demonizing Literally them. demons. Literally, in one example, demons. Then the most terrible things can happen. Education is incredibly powerful. And we can, we can and we should talk about this, the, the power of textbooks. And so on October the 7th, I stood there. Were front, you in Israel at the time? I was in Israel. And how, I, how, did, how did it catch you? It caught me on a Shabbat morning at 7.30 in the morning. I actually, it caught me with my uh, wife who got it before me, um, actually crying out. Hearing the sirens. Crying out with the television on in front mm. of her. Um, and I came in and stood with her in front of the television. And I think I felt what millions of us felt 
all over the world when we saw those scenes. But, you know, that connective tissue between the educational program and those actions, you know, it is without a shadow of a doubt a, a, a reality. It is, um, it is there. Why would you systematically incite young people from the first grade when you teach the Arabic letter ha um, for the word um, attack or jum or the word um, martyr? Sorry, just to, un- just to understand, you're yes. saying that one of the things that UNRWA is doing in these schools is teaching them the alphabet through, I mean, you know, yes. we all know in Hebrew first the grade. song Aleph oil bed the bait. First grade. You know, Aleph is a tent. Bet is a house. Exactly. What are they teaching in UNRWA schools? Exactly. So if you teach that a particular letter using words, the word for attack or the word for martyr, that can only be systematic, right? That can only be because you intend to radicalize generation after generation of young people. But you know what? Let, let's go back a stage. Um, UNRWA teach the Palestinian Authority School curriculum. Right, and this is this is what I want to understand from you specifically. When we talk about UNRWA schools, and it's important to understand the broader context here, that we have here a UN agency that predates the UN Refugee Agency, mm-hmm. has a very specific mandate to deal with the Palestinian refugees from the 1948 war and all of their descendants in perpetuity. According to the UN, 70, 75% of residents of Gaza are refugees. Right. And so the UN is responsible for their health and education services. UNRWA is teaching them in these schools, but 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 like who's writing the curriculum? Is this so, like some diplomat in New York who's writing the curriculum for the textbooks? Or like what are they teaching? So really, really important question. So, I mean, first of all, um, the majority of schools in Gaza are UNRWA schools. So... So Hamas has been in power since 2007, but it's not that they, Hamas controls the... Ed- although it's a bit more complicated. Well, no, I, I know, but your, your point is right. Um, Hamas took over the Palestinian Authority schools. Um, UNRWA have always had these majority of uh, schools in, in Gaza. So, by the way, if there were 3,000 terrorists that came over the border on October the 7th, uh, you don't have to be the world's greatest statistician to assume that the majority of them went to UNRWA schools, were UNRWA graduates. The others went to... That is horrific. Right. That's and, really and, horrific. And, to and, a, and a fact. And, and the others at went to... At least half of... At least half. Well, I mean, Indeed. when the alternative was going to Hamas schools, I don't know what's worse. Well, um, it is neither better nor worse because Hamas teach exactly the same curriculum okay, as so, so, does so, the so, Palestinian so what, Authority. What is this curriculum? There are UNRWA right. schools. These are textbooks that are written by some Swedish diplomat in New York. Right. I mean, who, what is the material? So these are textbooks written in Ramallah by the Palestinian Authority. They are taught to 1.3 million Palestinian school children, um, both in or, or three of Palestinian Authority schools, um, which are majoritatively in the West Bank. Um, UNRWA have the minority of schools in the West Bank. They are taught in UNRWA schools in both the West Bank and in Gaza, and Hamas as well, teaching the same curriculum. By the way, um, indicative to us that Hamas never had a problem with the Palestinian Authority's curriculum. They had so many problems with so much in relation to the PA, but the Palestinian Authority's curriculum was clearly radical enough, was clearly extreme enough to pass muster for Hamas's educational system. That's fascinating. I'd always assume that Hamas had taken over in 2007 and then instituted its own radical education system, but you're saying they're quite happy taking the same textbooks Absolutely. that are being taught in. Absolutely. There is, you know, they, they do have, did have extracurricular material. I would love to be able to say this is the past tense. The child soldier boot camps, unfortunately, Absolutely. we've been talking about. Absolutely. And UNRWA, by the way, also have extracurricular material. Um, it is just as bad as the original Palestinian Authority so, material. So wait, I, I want to understand, sure. why is, before we get onto what is actually in these textbooks, I'm trying to understand the landscape of sure. the education that the UN is providing to children sure. in Gaza. Why are they using Palestinian Authority textbooks? I mean, the UN operates mm-hmm. all around the world. It's on the ground in Yemen. I mean, is the, is the UN teaching with like Houthi mm. pirate textbooks so what in a, Yemen? What, what, what an, uh, an important comment. No. They do not. Um, the UN does not teach the Houthi curriculum in those schools which it has in Yemen. Now, Good. <laughs> uh, well, quite, Good. Quite, but it is, it is um, proof that you do not have to teach, as they say, the host nation curriculum. 
There is this idea that the UN has to teach the curriculum of the place where they are. It's not um, written in stone. It's not even written in um, United Nations protocols. It is a best practice, no more than that. Now, I think we can all um, take it as read that everything in this curriculum cannot ever be a best practice. It is the worst possible practice. So not only could UNRWA have changed the curriculum, but UN organizations, as you say, elsewhere in the world, and Yemen is a perfect example, have done this in the past. UNRWA, okay, made, we're, we're, UNRWA made a choice. UNRWA made a choice, and, and we're far enough into the podcast now that we've been you know, dunking on UNRWA and saying that it's been teaching a terrible curriculum that's been inciting to violence. What are they, what are they actually teaching? I mean, take me into mm. an UNRWA classroom. Little Palestinian children are arriving in Hamas-controlled Gaza. Like, how does the day start? Do they swear allegiance to the flag? What, mm -hmm. what, what, what is being taught? What is so bad about these textbooks? So, how bad is it really? Okay, so I think um, in order to, to understand it, one needs to understand the strategy. And the strategy is originally a Palestinian authority one. Um, when the Middle East was in the process of beginning to change their school curricula, which was kind of around about 2014 and, and, and moving um, onwards to, to today. What do you mean when the Middle East was changing I its mean curriculum? countries in MENA who began to improve their school curricula. And, and happy to this talk about those. This is a shift those. that we've seen since 2014. A shift in the sunny Muslim world, a very positive one. What is driving that shift? Each country is shifting for its own reasons. Um, Saudi Arabia has eliminated practically all the anti-Semitism in its school curriculum. Really? Um, absolutely. And, um, you know, the violent jihad is out. Homophobia is out. Really? Um, really significant changes. You know, That's extraordinary. It is extraordinary. And um, it is absolutely a part of Vision 2030 of right. MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, um, wanting a different Saudi Arabia. A plan to try to modernize Saudi Arabia and modern... they've made incredible strides as well in recent years. But as this trend is happening in the Middle East, and I do want to dive back into that later, sure. what is happening within the Palestinian Authority? So they went in completely the opposite direction. They had their own big reform in uh, 2014 to 2016. Grades one to um, four rolled out in 2016. 5 to 10, 2017, and the Taujihi, the, the, the matriculation grades in, in the last two years, they were um, significantly worse than the textbooks that came before. We have a few um, examples here. Sure. Just like, talk me okay. through what we're seeing here. Happy to do that. Uh, here we have a few examples from UNRWA uh, textbooks. This is from a report of sure. yours of Impact SE right. from last, uh, last year. Okay. What are we seeing here? Suicide bombings are glorified as is cutting the necks of the enemy? Well, this is, I, I think this is so, so desperate and awful because everything that we know about October the 7th, it is a story about resistance, about um, cutting necks, um, and about wearing explosive belts, the fadayin. This is used in this order to teach what teaching subject? Language. This is language. Arabic language, grade eight. The, the, so, the, sorry, grade eight UN schools. These are UN employees who are teaching indeed. children Arabic language through stories about the daggers of the Fedayeen that fell on the necks and yeah. suicide vests. Yeah. Now think about October the 7th and recall the connective tissue between what they were studying and what they did. Prophetic. What else do we have? We have another example over here. Uh, that comes from a different subject matter, calculus, right. taught by counting martyrs and suicide bombers. What do we have here? So, and again, let's remember this is a curriculum four. that is taught grade four right. by UN staff. By UN staff. And I think, I think the, the, the key idea here is this is, this is mathematics. Um, if you are going to use teaching mathematics, teaching addition to grade four to, to 11, 10, 11 year olds, through the idea of martyrdom, if you are going to insert... What is actually happening in this exercise? What are they being So they're, they're essentially being asked um, how many martyrs died in the first intifada, martyrs being terrorists who blew up shopping malls, mm -hmm. how many in the second intifada, how many do you get? Not apples or oranges or that which we are used to. I mean, but this I, seems almost like cartoonishly... It is. Cartoonishly evil. It is. It is cartoonishly evil, but it is also... Um, coldly strategic 
because you know the i the the slipping in in every opportunity of an extremist idea i think it's goes, a form of subliminal messaging it is and it go it's certainly subliminal messaging and it goes to the idea of the radicalization the purposeful radicalization of a whole generation and it's not Let's just what math. is taught but also what is not taught here we have something that actually we had an example within the textbooks of a unit on previous peace negotiations Indeed. with Israel and then what happened to those chapters absolutely so you know i, I think again those chapters are removed extraordinarily important any idea of peacemaking was was taken out um there was practically nothing left except a mention of the oslo accords where they dr arafat's letter to rabin which talks about cooperation so again um <laughs> the bit they left in they purposefully took out an idea of cooperation so that children might not get the idea that it's possible to cooperate with with Israelis the the idea of teaching calculus through counting suicide bombers or teaching arabic language through stories about suicide bombers right. is of course horrific and then i've got to ask you and i'm sure you're getting this question a lot from the lawmakers you're speaking to is this merely anecdotal mm. i mean have you just gone through these reports and found a couple of Mm. bad apples so to speak like really bad apples right or is this something more pervasive within the textbooks it's, per it's pervasive it, it suffuses the curriculum um across all grades do you have other favorite examples i use favorite in a cynical sense i do i i, I understand I, indeed I, you know i think to me the most coldly terrifying idea is telling young people that essentially dying is better than living um, there is a um, there is an exercise where they are told that a death through martyrdom is better than a life lived well, essentially. Um, and as a parent, um, as somebody who is who runs a research institute looking at peace and tolerance in education, so that we can have better societies of the future. You know, that idea absolutely, it, it terrifies me. I mean, it's deeply sad because when we look at what is happening right now in the Gaza Strip with the evolution of the war and the suffering that is experienced by civilians there, you can't avoid the thought about the way that these children who are suffering now as a result of the war that Hamas declared and has chosen to fight from behind and underneath civilian areas have also been brutalized over absolutely. the years. But but it's not just brutalized by Hamas and it's not brutalized by 17 years of Hamas rule. It's brutalized by the Palestinian Authority mm -hmm. and with the complicity of the United Nations, which Indeed. is which is extremely sad Indeed. and bleak. What what do you how do officials respond when you talk to them? Foreign leaders, lawmakers, mm. you present these examples to them and you say, look what is happening with your money. Look how they are stealing the future from these children, stealing the future of people in Israel as well, because right. because they raise them up on this radical right. diet. How, how do they respond mm -hmm. when you tell them where their tax dollars are going? Right. Um, you know, I think there was a pre-October the 7th and, and after October the 7th. Um, before October the 7th, there was genuine concern to shock. Um, by policymakers, lawmakers, um, the countries who were um, donating to to UNRWA, there was US, genuine concern there, and there, shock. There absolutely was, and um, yet the US remained the largest donor to UNRWA, something like a quarter of its budget. So this now it's true that a few years ago, under the Trump administration, mm -hmm. the State Department had said that it was that UNRWA was, I think, irredeemably flawed was right. the phrase, but it didn't shake them into. It, it did Action. not. It did not. Because I, I think um, I think for most reasonable, decent people, the idea that that kind of education could produce the horrors of October the 7th might have been just too much for them to be able to reach to. And so they reached for other things instead. You know, there were year after year resolutions in the European Parliament condemning the Palestinian Authority and UNRWA for teaching this hate curriculum. Um, oh, that's interesting. So so, yes. so, so th th you're saying that foreign countries that have been donating to UNRWA have been aware for a Indeed. long time, have been condemning it, right? but didn't actually connect the dots and think about the practical implications of what I, this sort of education was 
what was actually being done with their money. I, 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 think, that's, I think that's true. Um, again, absolute shock. Um, you know, I've heard lawmakers stand up in the European Parliament, one after the other, um, centre-left, centre, centre-right, and say, I would not allow my children to be taught this. Why, no, are, we, why are we paying for of this? Um, you know, decent people, good people. Um, you know, the, the European Commission actually froze well over 100 million euro to the Palestinian Authority for 13 months so that the curriculum would be changed. Um, the Palestinian Authority did not change the curriculum. But is there any sort in of follow-up? I mean, they're giving money. Right. There is an expectation of certain standards. Right. So how does the European Union or the US State Department, how do they react so, when they say, look, we're expecting certain standards. You need to stop teaching incitement. They don't. Right. So why is there no accountability? Why is there Indeed. no oversight? Indeed. I, I think for the Palestinian Authority, they just you know, essentially said, um, we're not going to do anything about this. We're not going to change our curriculum. Um, frankly, you cannot make us. You want to freeze your money, freeze your money. And, and in fact, the European They've Union, said that as bluntly as pretty that? Pretty much. I mean, Steyer stood up in a, the Palestinian prime minister, stood up in a cabinet meeting and said, you can, you know, cut off our water and our um, energy before we will change our school curriculum. Actually said that. Really? Palestinian prime minister, yes. Which is extraordinary because I found the same thing happening with... Um, same thing happening with UNRWA as well, and Philippe Lazzarini, the head right. of UNRWA, who of course feigned shock about the 13 UNRWA staff members mm -hmm. who were involved in the October 7 massacre. Right. Pull the other one, you've been warning them right. for long enough. Right. Uh, but feigning shock about that, at the same time as refusing an invitation to testify before the US Absolutely. House. So you have both UNRWA and the Palestinian Authority demanding this continued flow of international taxpayer Indeed. money while dodging any sort of Indeed. accountability or, or Indeed. scrutiny. And, and, and by the way, education is the majority of UNRWA's budget. Um, that is, you know, the biggest chunk. So imagine you're the US and giving, you know, $360 million a year, then, you know, you're talking about probably close to $200 million of that going to this insightful educational system. Um, and, and that's interesting that you say how much money is going into education because... One of the problems we're dealing with now is the question of how aid is going to be distributed sure. inside the Gaza Strip and sure. UNRWA claiming that it is an indispensable mechanism of sure. aid delivery. And one of the things we've been doing as Israel is coming and saying, UNRWA is not an aid distribution mm. agency. It, it, it's a welfare agency that provides education, park that thought to one side, social services, healthcare to the Palestinians. Right. It is not the sort of agency that does emergency relief in conflict zones at scale. And we think the Palestinians in Gaza right. will be better served by aid agencies whose budget is all about delivering humanitarian exactly. aid instead of exactly. this kind of education. Park that thought back to one side. Right. Let's talk about the education. Right. I mean, yeah, not, not my expertise at all, but my understanding is exactly that. Um, you know, their failure in education um, is, is, is clearly something that we are, we are discussing. But yes, they, they cannot do you know, the kind of crisis management which other UN organizations can do as well. But it does claim that it is at least doing a good job on education. So I'm wondering, right. just on in terms of teaching kids how to read, mm -hmm. teaching kids how to write, okay, they're teaching them to count through counting suicide bombers. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, is UNRWA meeting those standards in teaching them to count? I mean, like, are these exercises right. where they're teaching them to read through suicide bombers? Helping them to read, helping them to count. Mm. What can we say in terms of the objective mm. standards of taking these people and actually giving them an education? Right. So, so you know, I, I think there is absolutely a connection and there's quite a lot of research um, pointing to the fact that um, radical extremist education also fails pedagogically. And, and, I, and think, I, think, I think we have an example here from an yeah. UNRWA. I always say that uh, when people talk about poverty in the Gaza Strip, uh, terrorist regimes have never been very good for the free market right. and uh, and uh, middle class capitalism. But right. here you have, what are we seeing here of UNRWA's own reports right. about its own educational achievements? So uh, as I recall this re uh, report, it's UNRWA's report from 2022, essentially um, admitting to their failing grades, to their- Here we see a definite downward yeah, trend. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In and core educational ab parameters. Absolutely. Which, which, you know, goes against actually one of the claims of the World Bank, which is we have to continue supporting them because they are doing so well in education. But um, according to UNRWA's not, own reports, they are not. They're failing the kids. Exactly. I, I wonder, Marcus, we talk a lot about the 
textbooks and the bad examples in their incitement. Do the do the textbooks actually matter? Because I think back so, to my own education, and I yeah. know that my you know liberal education in London yeah, yeah. is probably nothing like what children are getting in a so-called refugee right. camp in Gaza. But I don't remember thinking that I was particularly influenced by the textbooks. And and you and I'm sure you were not. Um, the Middle East is entirely different in relation to... I mean, the subliminal messages in the Cambridge Latin course were probably a little bit different. <laughs> as from, we, as we were discussing. Right. But the, the Middle East is different. You get one book, one grade, one subject. Outside of Israel, which is very much the Western model, more like the European than the American model. Um, teachers prepare their own materials. Teachers prepare their own materials. But here it's more centralized. It, you are, it is absolutely centralized. So huh. again, one, one book, one grade, one subject. They, they're kind of about that thick. They look like a magazine. Um, students, pupils write inside of the books often. Um, they are changed every year, actually twice a year, because it tends to be two semesters. So every single... Wait, I want to understand. You're yes. saying these textbooks are changing. It's not that every this is a textbook from 10 year. years ago. And despite the criticism from the State Department and the European exactly. Union, these textbooks are being replaced, but not being replaced to get rid of the nasty stuff that the donors are insisting they get rid of as a condition for the aid? It is much easier than people think or know to change the current Palestinian school curriculum. 230 books, um, about 80 pages that thick. They are reprinted, as I said, um, each semester. Um, so that's two semesters. It's a matter of switching PDFs with material which doesn't incite to jihad, to martyrdom, to um, frankly cutting throats, um, which does not use examples of um, counting martyrs, but you know apples and pears. Um, this is something which can be done within frankly a few months, and this has always been the case. And this is what we have been saying to policymakers and lawmakers for years and years. UNRWA does not have to teach this curriculum because they actually print themselves the PA curriculum. They just don't change it. So you switch a few PDFs, you get a graphic designer in, um, you get some teachers to put in neutral values, or God help us, values of peace and tolerance, you can have a completely new curriculum. UNRWA refused. Are, are you noticing since October 7th, not only with your testimony on the Hill, mm. but conversations with other policymakers, that the pennies dropped and there is a desire to insist as mm. a condition for funding that the curriculum be changed. This isn't just a question of a few bad apples who participated in the October 7 massacre. It's not just that 10% of UNRWA members are paid Hamas or Islamic Jihad operatives. It's not just that 50% of mm. them have a first degree relative who is a Hamas or Islamic Jihad operative. The whole educational right. infrastructure is rotten, is are you hearing more receptiveness? I, I, I absolutely think that is the case. And that is certainly the US and that is certainly Europe. Um, and, you know, when we think of the day after, I don't think the day after is, is that far away. But we'll get to the day after. I right. want to understand first but, the day now, which so, is Hamas's so to, involvement in those schools, right. which is we're saying it's the Palestinian Authority curriculum that's being taught by the yeah. United Nations. But Hamas has been in power in the Gaza Strip since 2007. Yeah. And I'm wondering, do they just give these UNRWA schools total educational autonomy saying, we trust the PA curriculum is radical enough, good luck? Or is Hamas meddling in some other way in the UNRWA school curriculum? I, I think we found that Hamas is meddling in many ways in UNRWA schools. Um, How? Again, not, not... Apart from hiding rockets in them and tunnel shafts, which we know right. about uh, ad nauseum. And, uh, absolutely. So, you know, that is, that is absolutely what I am... Um, uh, referring to, I think we know about teacher after teacher that was a that have been members of Hamas. Mm -hmm. um, we know about undergraduate after graduate who Hamas celebrated as um, as martyrs over over the years. Um, and so, you know, that is that Not is at least the terrorists who participated in the Black September, uh, the Black September terrorists behind the 1972 Munich Olympics exactly. massacre. Perhaps the most famous example of. Exactly. Terrorists who are direct products of the quote unquote refugee camps. Absolutely. And and and, and a long list which um Hamas memorialized on their website of, of their, their their own martyrs. Um you know, the same curriculum in Hamas schools, in PA schools and under schools. So Hamas did not really need to, you know, mess too much with that. But if you know I, I just want to go back to um, you know, the question you raised about the 
authoritative nature of textbooks and yes. how for you that wasn't so much the case. Um, they are incredibly authoritative in the Middle East because, as I said, there is just the one of them, because teachers don't have wiggle room. They don't bring in their own material. They are um, civil servants in authoritarian places who know that they teach what they're expected to teach if they know what's good for them. They come with teacher guides, each mm -hmm. textbook, so they know exactly what to teach. And students, pupils in the Middle East um, are highly aware that what they are receiving is a set of values, a national identity, which is being passed down to them by, by the rulers, uh, for which there is a great deal of respect, sometimes fear, but a real understanding that these textbooks, this is the narrative. This is the national narrative. This is who we are expected to be as adults. And that, you know, works for good or for bad. It works well, appallingly badly for the PA. It works extremely well now for the UAE, Saudi, other countries that we can talk about. And I'm glad you raised that because we have seen an extraordinary shift in attitudes in the Gulf in recent years right. with the normalization accords with Israel, the willingness to put this conflict behind, realize there was no rational or logical reason for these countries to right. have a conflict with Israel, embrace it, have peace. What are you seeing in those countries? And, and, and does that give you any hope for de-radicalization in the... We, we started this conversation mm -hmm. saying UNRWA schools, but it's actually Palestinian Authority uh, education system. Exactly. So th the answer is... Um, I still have enormous hope about um, peace and tolerance in the MENA region, um, watching these educational reforms. And not just watching, but we are very much participating in it, working with governments. We'll not, don't obviously need to go into too much detail there. But, you know, imagine the Saudi Arabian curriculum, which was the bugbear of the State Department after 9-11 for years and years. And they did everything that they could do um, to get these changes. These changes didn't happen until 2019, and then they happened in the most dramatic way. The United States. You're Arab saying Emirates, we'd be better off if they started teaching the Saudi curriculum in the Gaza Strip. I am saying exactly that. I'm saying That's take examples idea. from the Saudi, United Arab Emirates, Moroccan, Egyptian curriculum up to grade six, which is where their reform has gone to, so you don't want to go further than that yet. Um, yes, there are remarkable examples there. Islamic education taught in a peaceful, embracing way. Um, the Abrahamic faiths embrace, the other embrace, respect for the other, for the individual other, peacemaking is a way to resolve conflict that are taught in a, across subjects. You know, again, United Arab Emirates, from Islamic studies to language, to literature, to what they call um, the moral education syllabus, which is just, just fantastic. And actually, I can say that we have a joint venture with the United Arab Emirates Ministry of Education. Um, yes, you can lift great chunks of that, transfer it, and, you know. But in order to do that, an active decision had to be made on the part of the leaders. And that's why I'm wondering, mm. one of the questions I get is, you can't defeat Hamas. Hamas is an idea. And mm. I say, okay, we know that we can't defeat an idea. We can remove it from power. We can destroy its military infrastructure. Right. De-radicalization mm. the day after Hamas is going to require right. the involvement of the international community. But if these UNRWA textbooks are, are in fact just Palestinian Authority textbooks, it means that in order to de-radicalize Gaza, and I'm having this dawning, sinking realization right now. Got to go for PA. It's not enough, actually, yeah. just for the UN to say we need to teach a better curriculum. It's going to require an opt-in from the Palestinian Authority and an active decision that it wants to jettison what is basically the core of the mm -hmm. Palestinian national movement, which is the violent rejection of the state of Israel in any borders whatsoever. And I'm not sure that we're seeing that willingness now. I, I, I entirely agree with you. But, but I would say that, you know, worst case analysis, if you do make those changes to those textbooks in Gaza, that is not nothing. Um, I... I do not entirely accept the idea that you cannot beat ideology. You know, Hitler, when elected, changed all the textbooks in Germany. By 1939, he had a, the kind of cadre that he needed to join the Einsatzgruppen and commit the most horrific acts. 
after the war, the Germans entirely changed their educational system. They changed the textbooks and a de-radicalization process occurred there. Now, um, these things are possible. These things are possible in Gaza. They're possible for all If it happened in Nazi schools. Germany, it can happen in Hamas, Gaza. Marcus, I know you like your job at Impact SE and you're doing really very important work. I want to give you a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> if I were to if I were to give you a promotion, which is not in my power to give, but if I were to give you a promotion <laughs> to uh, UN Under Secretary General for Education Affairs, mm -hmm. and we say it's the day after Hamas, the Hamas government has been dismantled, Israel has achieved total victory in mm -hmm. Gaza, the hostages, please God, are released. Those who are still alive, those who are not released home to their family for burial. You are now in charge mm -hmm. of designing the education infrastructure in Gaza because the UN has decided to atone for its sins and make sure that the next generation is mm -hmm. brought up on peace and reconciliation. How would you begin going about that so, challenge? So first of all, absolutely a demotion. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I adore my job and I would hate that job. But um, Well, if duty the, calls. If duty calls, not rocket science. Um, the first thing that you need to do... And, and rocket science is also something they teach in honor schools. Absolutely. As we find, yes. Absolutely. Frank, sadly, yes. Um, pun intended. Pun intended. The changing of the curriculum can be done, as I said, in a matter of weeks. And that would be in that imaginary role. The first thing that, that I would get done, and it wouldn't take that many people that much money to get it done. As I said, UNRWA is reprinting those books anyhow, um, essentially taking the PA curriculum, putting their own cover on it. So, do you see any prospects for doing for switching PDFs within UNRWA at the moment, or do you think that in order to switch the PDFs, you just need to erase this awful agency and start anew with a new organisation that that hasn't been co-opted by cooperating with and in cahoots with terrorists for all its existence? So, so, so I think. Again, as a research institute focusing on peace and tolerance in education, UNRWA has um, entirely failed. It's failed in its duty of care. It's failed in every mission that it had to care for young people. I cannot see a universe that UNRWA can continue to be teaching. And by the way, that's in the West Bank as well. You know, those schools celebrated the, um, the attacks UNRWA schools in the West Bank celebrated... What do you mean they celebrated? The, I mean, a UNRWA school um, had a big assembly where they read poetry um, praising the attacks of October the 7th in the West that Bank. That is horrific. And, and actually put, opened the textbooks to show examples of how, um, you know, they should be inspired by what is in the textbooks. So, you know, we've got to remember that UNRWA goes beyond Gaza. But in, you know a universe where one had that kind of control, I would say whoever is in charge of education in Gaza the day after, first immediate and perfectly doable step, change the textbooks, switch the PDFs, reprint them. The material actually exists. The, mater the moderate material Do you see exists. a role for neighboring states, Gulf countries in helping the Palestinians adapt their curriculum in yeah. terms of offering without, a more tolerant version of Islam? Without, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, you know, Have we, you been speaking to them about we, Just let me, um, I think what, what I will say is that remarkable people in the UAE, for example, Ministry of Education, who spend an enormous amount of time working out how to use UNESCO benchmarks of peace and tolerance together with wasatiya, with, with, with um, Islamic Arabic ideas of peace and tolerance, which actually pretty much, you know, put together nicely in, in the educational field. Um, they could be incredibly useful in this. Um, there are folks and ministers of education all over the Middle East who could be incredibly useful in this. This is their day to day. This is their bread and butter. And this is a problem with UNRWA. They have always made this out to be impossible. And we have our checks and balances. And, you know, for years we went through these discussions at State Department, um, European um, Commission and other places where we went through one of those checks and balances and showed how they do not work, how there is no accountability, no transparency, how they are... An active the desire to avoid scrutiny as well. An active desire to avoid scrutiny. When we asked... UNRWA and others asked UNRWA, okay, we get it. You um, have a whole set of um, active measures to prevent the teaching of hate. Show it to us. Show us what you t 
tell teachers to do, it never And they appeared. have nothing to show. And the, the United States government um, showed this as well. In um, 2019, with their you know, accountability uh, report, they showed that UNRWA does not, in fact, do what it says it does and tells teachers, theoretically, not to teach the bad bits. However, that was supposed to work. Nobody ever understood it in the first place. And unfortunately, we see that same pattern of UNRWA's avoidance of scrutiny and oversight, not only with education, but also with its failure delivering aid Indeed. in Gaza, deflecting blame onto Indeed. Israel, of course, scapegoating it as a way to cover up its failure. Marcus, this has been really interesting. I'm, I'm on the one hand thinking this is so much worse than I thought because mm. it's not a question of bad UNRWA schools. It's the whole Palestinian Authority. But on the other hand, optimistic that if de-radicalization could happen in neighboring countries, the neighboring countries that we expect to play a major role right. the day after Hamas, then maybe that is a positive influence that can be brought to bear. 100%. Marcus Sheff, CEO of Impact SC, and maybe one day UN Undersecretary General <laughs> for God Educational help me know. Affairs. <laughs> well, if there's any hope the day after Hamas. Marcus Sheff, thank you very much for coming hey, on Lon, State of the Nation. Such a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you, my friend. And that brings us to the end of today's episode of State of the Nation podcast. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Marcus Sheff. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts on Apple Podcasts or iTunes or Spotify or YouTube. And we'll be back with more discussion soon about the state of our nation. Thank you very much.